Thank you, Jeff. So this is a workshop. So I've taken off my jacket. I'm rolling my sleeves. We're going to work here. So I want to start right away. I put a question up here. Uh, who was your best friend as a child? So think back to your childhood. Some of you, that'll be harder than others. Think back to your childhood. Who comes to mind as your best friend when you were a child? And then think about what made you click with that person. Who wants to just share a little bit uh, about that together? So uh, think for a moment. Everybody got a name? You got, got a name in your mind? Somebody? And what made you click? What, what, what caused you to talk? What, what, you don't have to tell us who your best friend was. What made you click? What, your, your friend. You can mention them. OK. Lot, good sense of humor, lots of fun to be with. Okay, Patrick. Both came from dysfunctional families. But by the way, our our, pa our senior pastor did a Tuesday evening workshop on dysfunctional families, and he stood up and he said, "I just would like to let you know that we're going to talk tonight about dysfunctional families." He said, "I want you to know what my credentials are." He said, "I came from a dysfunctional family and I raised one." You see, you read the Bible. Every 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 family in the Bible is dysfunctional. So welcome to the human race. So anyway, so you both came from similar backgrounds. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Jim, how about you? Yeah, so neither of you really were fitting in, so you found each other, right? Awesome, great. Bill, how about you? We have one brave woman who's here in this male friendship seminar. Who, uh, Franny, who is, who's your best friend and what, what caused you guys to connect? Acceptance. Acceptance? She accepted you both? both? Yeah? Awesome. Others who want to jump in, something you think about, you want to share with the rest of the group. Lee, how about you? So some you, you some you did together. Awesome. Yeah, uh, Michael. I just found this this uh, friend of mine just passed on, and uh, she was so pleased to be around, and I just loved her. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, fantastic. So you were drawn to him because of you had fun together. He was fascinating to be around. Yeah. Awesome. 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 Well, what I'd like us to do today is journey for the next hour, just thinking about what does it take to have friends kind of friends I think God intends for us to have and what difference can that make, what difference might that make and how can we be more purposeful about, about doing that together. But before we go any further, I want to ask you to think about one other thing for a moment. One of my friends, a mentor of mine, wrote a book called Stop Setting Goals If You'd Really Rather Solve Problems. And he said the whole human race can be divided into two bits. Half of us, he would say, are goal setters. Half of us, he would say, are problem solvers. And he said, you can figure out which side you fit by a simple test. On a Saturday morning, if you have a list of 10 things to do, and you can hardly get out of bed in the morning because you've got the 10 things you want to go do, then you are a goal setter. On the other hand, if you, on Saturday morning, have 10 things you have to do, and you do not want to get out of bed because you've got to face all this stuff because it's just a list of problems, then you are a problem solver. So based on that very simple diagnostic, try and figure out, okay, there's no right or wrong. Both, both half the human race is either one. So think about it. Where, where do you sit? Would you tend to be a, someone who could hardly wait to get out of bed and get after that list, therefore a goal setter? Or would you, oh, man, I don't want to tackle that list. It's all those problems. I'm a problem solver. So put up your hand if you would self-identify as a problem solver. Okay, so maybe 40% uh, maybe of us here. My wife is a problem solver. Okay, so that's, I, I get that. Okay, and then goal setter. Okay, so uh, maybe a little bit more, maybe 50, 60% of the group. I, I would tend to s identify myself as a goal setter. This has caused problems for us in our marriage, right? Because we see the world fundamentally different all the time. But we figured out what to do on Saturday mornings. She makes the list, gives it to me, I get out of bed, and she goes back to sleep. So it works, it works really well, it works really well for us in our, 
in our marriage. But you know, um, thinking about what we're like, you know, I, I, God made me maybe as a goal setter. Uh, I was privileged when I finished the book that you've got lying on the table there. Um, I was invited by uh, Dennis Rainey to come to Family Life Today in Little Rock, Arkansas, and they interviewed me for the program. And just before we went on air, they said, you know, David, this interview is going to be real easy <clears throat> because you're the expert on your book. So we're just going to ask you about your book. So don't be afraid. Everything's going to be fine. Don't believe it when people say that. So we get on air, and they said, you know, most of us, you've written a book about male friendship. Most of us didn't come out of the womb wanting to create male friendships. Tell, could you please help the rest of us normals to understand why you do that? That was how we started. So thank you very much. So, but it is kind of funny that I got asked to do this. You see, if you were to ask me what I'm like as a goal setter, I want to get things done. I want to do things. If I go into a room, I see the pictures that need to be straightened. I see the shoes that need to be put side by side. In fact, it really bothers me if the shoelaces are draping on the floor, because they should be inside the shoes, right? My wife goes into the room. What do you think she sees? The people. Right? She's the relationship one, right? I see the stuff. She sees the people. So it's pretty weird that I would be the one who'd written a book about male friendship, wouldn't you think? I, I, I am a task-oriented functionary, and I've written a book about friendship. So the reason I start with that is if I can build quality relationships, anybody can. That's the good news, okay? Because I am a task-oriented functionary. I did not come out of the womb built for this. But God made us all capable of doing this. So I'd like to share with you a little bit about my journey. Is that fair? Feel free to interrupt at any time. We're not going to have any PowerPoint presentations. I've seen all, you've seen all my stuff that way. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is just talk to you a little bit about how did I find my... Huh? Nice tie, thank you. You know what? This tie used to be wider. I love it so much I had my tailor take it in so I could keep wearing it because it's one of my favorite ties. Um, I kid you not, I kid you not. Um, uh, now I've lost everybody. They're thinking about the tie now. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do today is share with you a little bit how did a task-oriented functionary end up deciding to pursue deep, intimate friendships the way Jesus had them with Peter, James, and John. And then secondly, I want to share with you what difference does it make or what difference has it made in my life. And in the middle, I want to talk about three myths that I think probably are in your mind. If you're thinking about this topic, you're going to, uh, you know, I, th I think it probably means this or that. I'm gonna, I'd like to, to explode some of those myths. So why don't I just start by telling you how did I first start thinking about this topic. And it really happened when I was up at a, at a camp when I was 23, and the speaker came and chatted. He was a young life guy, so young life people are kind of into relationships, so he was talking about relationships. And I remember he said, Chuck Ferguson was his name, I remember Chuck said, if I died tonight, or if my wife and I died tonight, we were killed in a car accident, he said, we have another couple that are such good friends with us that if we were killed, this other couple would be in our home, sleeping in our bed, looking after our children. And I remember thinking, wow, that's pretty radical. I remember thinking, I don't have friends like that. I played rugby all through high school and university. I had, I had buddies. I didn't have friends like that. I remember thinking, I sure would like to have friends like that. That sounds really cool. And then Chuck Ferguson said, how many, how many close friends did Jesus have? And like a moron, I put up my hands, 12. And he said, no, wrong. Jesus did have 12 disciples, but he, he said, you know, there was this close, special relationship that Jesus had with Peter, James, and John. And then he got, it was really unfair. Then he started to resort to scripture to make his point. So let me just share with you three tiny vignettes from Jesus' relationship with these three guys. Because first of all, Peter, James, and John were there right at the beginning. Let me read to you from Mark chapter 1, verse 16. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, Peter, and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, fishing for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little further up the shore, he saw 
Zebedee's sons, James and John, the sons of thunder, they were in a boat fixing their nets. He called them at once and they followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. So Peter, James, and John, they were three of the first disciples. And they were there from the very beginning. And then we go a little bit further on. If we go to Mark's gospel again a little bit further on in in chapter 9, first couple of verses. The Mount of Transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus went up to the mountain and he took with him Peter, James, and John. And he led them high to the mountain. And as the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever have made them. So he took to this mountaintop experience. Who did he choose? He chose Peter, James, and John to be with them for that amazing experience. And then the last one I'd like to share with you from Mark's Gospel again, chapter 14, verse 32. As Jesus is heading towards the cross or in the shadow of the cross, they went to the olive grove called Gethsemane. My wife and I had the privilege of being there a year ago. And Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John. And he became deeply troubled and distressed. And he told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. At the beginning they were there. The mountaintop they were there. The deepest, darkest moments they were there. Jesus chose to spend time with Peter, James, and John. And, you know, Chuck Ferguson said, you know, Jesus is a model for life. Yes, he came to die for us, but he also should be a model. He should be a model for relationships. And I thought, I never thought about it that way. You guys need another chair? Here. And um, so um, Jesus said, Jesus spent time with these three. Now, Jesus spent time with the 12, right? No, 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 No coincidence that the that the fastest growing churches in the world all have an emphasis on small groups. I think God designed us to have, be in small groups of 12 to be supported. Not unlike a convene group, perhaps, but, or a Bible study group. You know, God in, has intended us to learn in community with, with groups like that. Thank you. Am I going to need this? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So um, Jesus would like us to be in, I think God would like us to be in relationships with 12. He'd like us to be in relationships with two or three, like Peter, James, and John. Jesus also, what did he do? He got up early in the morning to go to pray, to be with his heavenly Father. And God, I think he would like us to do that. You'll be happy I'm not going to talk too much about the getting up early in the morning and praying business, but I think we ought to be doing that. And then, of course, he spent time with the multitudes. He was in synagogue. He was in worship. I think Jesus as a model for relationships. He's, there's, there's the four things. Time alone in the garden, time with the multitude, time with the 12, and then time with the three. I think if we follow his example how to live... I think we ought to be investing. And so what I want us to focus our time on today is how can we, in our lives, invest in having relationships like Jesus had with Peter, James, and John? Because that's how I think God intended us to live. Like it or lump it, that's, I think, part of the deal. That's what he wants for us. So what happened to me? The task-oriented functionary. So I hear Chuck Ferguson talking about this thing. I'm thinking I'd like to have that. I have no clue where to start. So my, my wife and I were not married at the time. We were d- just, just dating, getting to know each other. And I remember I worked at a restaurant that was a, got a, a steak uh, restaurant, it had food, uh, a, um, a salad bar and roast beef and steak kind of place. And so I had an um, apron that I used to wear and I used to work at this restaurant. And we got to take dates there for half price. So where did I take my wife for all of our dates? We went to Victoria Station for all of our dates. So we went for dinner, and I was giving him, uh, chatting with her a little bit, and I was really worried about this friendship thing. I didn't know how to do this. So I said to her, you know, if we were ever to get married, I wouldn't know who to invite to be the best man. And those of you who are in sales, that's known as a trial close, right? <laughs> and so um, I was really pleased that she saw this as a problem. And I said, you know, how do you think we should solve this? She said, well, why don't we make a list? My, my wife, the non-list maker, she said, why don't we make a list of candidates? So uh, I said, great, do you have a piece of paper and a pen? She went into her purse for an hour and tried to find. So she got out a pen and a piece of paper, and we listed 10 candidates for best man at our wedding. I told you I'm a task-oriented functionary. I don't recommend you do it this way. This is what we did. We made a list of 10 people, and we prayed over the list that God would help me to figure out how somehow I can find a best man for our wedding. 
how did I find those two guys? Well, God brought them into my life. It was very interesting. One day I was working at this restaurant still, and one of the other guys there, I knew him a little bit. And um, after work, he got off shift a bit early, and um, I just went up to him, and I had, I don't recommend you do this. I just went up to him and said, I'd like to spend more time with you. <laughs> he got in his car and drove away. I told him, what's that about? Right? Uh, um, like, he's going like, it was, it, was, it was not pretty, especially when I was wearing my apron. Anyway, um, the other guy, but anyway, D Dean and I eventually kind of started, he, he, he agreed to have breakfast with me from time to time. The other guy I met, I'm, some of you know, I'm a competitive water skier. I was at a camp, and we were taking a bunch of people skiing, and I was in the back of the boat, and a bunch of other people were skiing, and another guy was in the back of the boat, and the person fell. And so I was coiling some rope on one side, and I looked over in the back of the boat. Mike was over there putting a bumper away because it was untidy. And I thought, I just said to him, I need a roommate. Would you be willing to tidy my house? He said, sure. So we moved in together. And, um, you know, the, true story. This is how I met these guys. One of them, we just happened to bump into each other at work. The other one, we happened to bump into each other in the back of a ski boat. And my point is, there's no magic to this. You can find, you can find friends anywhere. I found one of them at work and one of them in the back of a ski boat. But what we did do is we decided to be purposeful about it and start hanging out together because I wanted to experiment with what does this mean. And uh, we purposed to get together for breakfast. And Mike and I ended up living together in a house with three or four other guys while we were at university. And we cultivated relationships. And so three years later, when my wife and I did get married, uh, Dean was the best man at our wedding and Mike was the head usher. And, we, and I was privileged to be the best man at both of their weddings because all because I just happened to blunder into, like, I don't know how to do this, but can we hang out? You know, some people say to me when I, they get a copy of my book or they hear me talk about this, how do you do this? I recommend coffee. You don't, look, you don't have to go look for somebody. Well, just, just ask people to have coffee. Just start anywhere. And that's how I had the privilege of getting started with these guys and beginning to, to journey in friendship. But along the way, you know, uh, we, we ended up leaving Vancouver and moved to Calgary, and I'm going to... Now I've lost my two friends. So you know what I did? I prayed that God would give me two friends. And he gave me Bruce and Ron. We only lived in Calgary for two years, but he gave me two men who I could hang with during the time we lived in Calgary. And then we went to Toronto. And well, now I've lost, what the heck am I going to do next? And I prayed, and he gave me Mark and Barry for the two years we were in Toronto. And then we moved to California. We were only there for a year, down in Orange County. And he gave me Mark and Doug. Then we moved out to Vancouver and I prayed and he gave me Carson and Bob who I ended up writing this book with. And I, my point is not to say David moves every two years and he gets new friends everywhere. My point is it's not that difficult. I just prayed and made myself available. And God brought into my life people who I was able to support and who were able to support me. And so but what I'd like to share with you today is that uh, I think if you're, if you're with me so far, you might be interested, but you're going... Yeah, I'm not so sure what this is like. So I want to share with you some myths. The first myth I'd like to share with you is if you're thinking about this, and I alluded to this earlier today, if you're with me, you're probably thinking that real men go it alone. And so this is kind of mamby-pamby stuff, but real men go it alone. Like I said earlier, you know, uh, Bill Gates built Microsoft by himself. Churchill won the Second World War by himself, right? We tend to think about real men going it alone. I'd like to talk to you about my dad, because I think he was, I think he was a real man. I, I mentioned to you, he helped build this company, the half a billion in assets in the Benthol Center, and one of the top 100 companies to work for in Canada, and boards of directors, all the accolades, uh, honorary degree from the university, a member of the Order of Canada for his community work. I mean, this guy, he, he did kind of okay in his career. My dad also invested in relationships. He was a relationship guy. And I remember asking him one day um, what he thought about salespeople. And he said, well, salespeople belong on a spectrum. And he said, at one end of the spectrum uh, are thieves and murderers, and the other end of the spectrum are pastors and nurses, those who love and protect life and those who take things and take life. And he said, salespeople belong over with the thieves and murderers. <laughs> and I said, isn't that a little bit harsh? And he said, no, salespeople don't add value. They just lie to you to try and get you to buy their stuff. So this is, what, this is how I grew up. My dad, my, you know, and my dad was not much of a teacher. He didn't often get as specific about things as that. But 
many years later, I moved back to Vancouver in 1986, and I had four separate people say to me, your dad's the best salesman I ever met. So that, made, that stood me on my ear. Like, what the heck is that about? Do you know what, my da- you know what I realized? First of all, my dad did not see himself as a salesman. But my dad was real. He had relationships with people. He would find, he, he said, I said, what do you do for a living? He said, I just try and find out what people need and help them get it. That's all. My dad had, re- my dad had real relationships with people. And so... As my father's career progressed, uh, he grew in prominence in our city, and, and then as he moved into his 70s, he started to slip into the world of Alzheimer's, became confused. I'll never forget the, the, um, when my uh, sisters and my brother-in-law and I were having a board meeting, and dad was at the board, and uh, Mr. Myers was our chairman, and my, Phil was my brother-in-law, and my brother's Chuck, and my sister's Mary, and my other sister's Helen. And Dad came into the room. He said, I just got off the phone from Mary, and Dick, if it's okay with you, we'll go ahead. Phil's coming in a few minutes. And we're all completely bewildered. And he had confused Phil and Dick and Mary and Helen and David and Chuck, right? So it, it, would be, it was funny that day. But over time, we began to realize this was a serious thing as Dad began to lose his faculties. Not long after, my mom succumbed to cancer and was taken from him. About the same time, my uncles took control of the family business and cut my father's wealth in half and unceremoniously discharged him from the company. My dad, the love of his life was gone. His health was gone. His prominence was gone. What's going to happen to you when your health is gone? when your prominence is gone, when the love of your life is gone. My father had invested in relationships, and you know what we saw? We were in his home because my mom had died, and we lived with my dad after mom was gone. My, sister, my wife and, and kids and I, we lived with my dad. We, for four years, my dad lived after mom. We lived in their, their home. Every Tuesday morning, Frank Burnham, for four years, came to have breakfast with my dad. Every Thursday morning, one of his other friends, Alan Jernus, came and had breakfast with my dad. For a while, it was kind of fun. They'd, they'd hang out. After a while, it was, they'd take him in the wheelchair for a drive. After a while, it was, they'd come and they'd have breakfast and dad couldn't get out of bed. But we witnessed these men for four years because my dad had invested in relationships. Who are you going to have? when your prominence is gone, when the love of your life is gone, when your health is gone. My dad was a real man, I think, but he invested in quality relationships, and so when his life was ebbing away, he had people who were there. So, first thing, I think real men don't go it alone. I think real men like my dad invest in quality relationships. Real men like Jesus invest in quality relationships. The second myth, I think most of us think, if you're serious about this, you probably think that friendship is built on common interest. We talked about that. We thought, talked about little kids or as friends as kids. You know, we did stuff together. And I grew up thinking, you know, friendship is built on common hobbies. I was kind of worried about this because one fellow I was interested in having a closer friendship with, we were on an airplane together. He's a professional uh, a lawyer by profession, and we were sitting side by side, and he was reading this big, thick book. And I, I said, what are you reading? And he said, I'm reading Cases. And I said, wait, you've got a trial you're preparing for? He said, no, I read cases as a hobby. <laughs> Weird, right? And so I was really happy when I learned, actually, we don't have to have common hobbies to have friends, okay? We don't have to, and, and your friends don't have to be ones that have common hobbies. Nothing wrong with golfing together, although questionable pastime, but anyway. Uh, those of us who water ski, we prefer big round red balls in the, the, rather than the little white ones. But anyway, um, you know, it's, it's fine to do things together, but friendship is not built on common hobbies. The reason I want to s- declare that today is I was kind of poking around, trying to learn about this thing, right? Task-oriented, functionary, trying to understand how this works. And I got to know Dr. James Houston. Some of you might have heard of him. He's widely uh, published. 
he was originally from uh, Oxford. He was a uh, uh, geography professor in Oxford, and 40 years ago he left Oxford and came to Canada and established a place called Regent College, a Christian college on the University of Campus, uh, University of British Columbia. I was talking to Jim one day, and I told him I was trying to learn about this, and he said, how do you build quality relationships like Jesus had with Peter, James, and John? I said, well, I, I think it's common hobbies. He said, no, 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 no. And I said, what is it? He said, friendship is built. Are you ready? It's the only, the only thing you have to remember today. Friendship is built on the mutual sharing of weakness. It ain't what we naturally want to sign up for. Okay? Friendship is built on the mutual sharing of weakness. That's it. That's all you need to know. And I remember thinking, that is ridiculous. <laughs> I remember getting on an airplane. I was flying to another city, and a friend of mine was with me on the plane. We didn't know each other very well. His name was Raymond, and I told him, I said, do you know what Dr. Houston from... Oxford thinks, he thinks friendship is built on the mutual sharing of weakness. Like, how ridiculous is that? And he said, yeah. He said, that's crazy. He said, David, we could never be friends, you and I. He said, because you grew up on the wealthy side of the tracks. I grew up on the other side of the tracks. We could never be friends, because I'm intimidated whenever I'm with you. And I said, yeah, I know, Raymond. I could never be friends with you, because you are so intelligent. Whenever I'm with you, I am so frightened over my mouth, because I don't want to make a fool of myself. I'm just so afraid, because you're so intellectually brilliant. I'm so intimidated whenever I'm with you. And as I confessed my in intimidation of him, as he confessed his, we kind of tumbled backward into a friendship as we confessed our weakness. And it's interesting, you know, you've seen those ads that say, don't try this at home. Uh, try this at home. Try sharing something of yourself with someone else and see if you can stop, sharing, stop them from sharing something of themselves. I tried this one day on, with my, our eldest daughter, Christy. Uh, for me to train as a water skier, I drive about an hour every Tuesday, Thursday morning down to a lake near our home. And I have an hour in the car and an hour on the way back. So I habitually have people come with me. So it's, it's, I don't do coffee. I do, let's go to the lake. And so our daughter Christy came with me. We drove the hour down and she, we hung out. I was kind of hoping for a meaningful time. I wanted to listen. I wanted to hear from her some stuff. My intention was to connect with my daughter. I was getting nothing. So we went down to the lake, had an hour, and then we hung out at the lake for a couple hours. It was fun. Got in the car, and we're driving home. And we're about halfway home, and I'm starting to panic. I've got nothing out of these hours spent with my daughter. She's not sharing anything. What do I do? And I thought, I know what. I'm going to share something about me. I'm going to share something about her. I'll see if I can stop her from sharing something back. And so I told her, I said, Christy, I'm really worried about this and struggling with this. What would you do? She said, well, Dad, Everybody knows you should do this, this, and this, and this, and this. Oh, geez, sweetheart, thank you very much. It's great. I just got quiet. It was less than 60 seconds. She said, Dad, you know what I'm struggling with? Could you help me? I challenge, try it. Try it at home. It's pretty safe. Share something of yourself. See if you can stop other people. And so I would submit to you that um, friendship is not built on common interests. Rather, it's built on common hobby. Sorry. Not built on common hobbies, but rather built on the mutual sharing of weakness. The last myth of the three that I want to share with you is I think that uh, we tend to think that friends are found kind of like a lost penny. You know, we even use that language, right? We say, I found a friend. It's true, you can find them. Kind of like you're wandering through the forest and they're not supposed to be there and there's a penny on the ground, you pick it up, right? It's, friendships can be made. And I want to talk to you a little bit about our daughter, Jenny, because our daughter, Jenny, we've got four kids. Our daughter, Jenny, is the best friend maker in our family. And when she graduated from high school, she crossed the stage and she was given the home ec prize as the best home ec student. And she also got a language prize, speaking French. And what did she end up doing later on? She went to France and studied at the Cordon Bleu cooking school. So she was heading in that direction. But as she was walking across the stage, one of my wife's friends leaned over to my wife and said, she should have got the best friend maker prize too. Because there was a girl at, our, at her school who nobody spent any time with. Jenny went over, she found out this girl's her parents were going through a divorce and Jenny spent time with Loria and befriended her and looked after her. Jenny's the kind of person, you know, lots of teenagers can throw a party, if you, uh, you can, they can get a lot of people that can arrive. Jenny's the only one I know who could say to me on a Wednesday, which she did one day, she said, Dad, is it okay if I have a few of my close friends over on Friday night? I said, no problem, 70 people, right? 
and, and you know, for some people, that would just be a party. No, Jenny would know all of those people and their stories, right? Because Jenny was um, fantastic. Jenny was purposeful about reaching out. And I want to illustrate that from my own life. As I was thinking about this whole thing, uh, I remember one day I was walking back to my office. Uh, sorry, I was in my office, and a friend of mine was walking back past the door of my office, um, and he poked his head in after lunch, and he said, Hey, Bentall, who are you accountable to? And I said, Well, why do you ask? And he said, Well, a couple of us were talking at lunch, and we figured a guy with your last name, with the five towers in the city of Vancouver, you're probably not accountable to anybody. I've always believed that the best defense is a good, is a good offense. And so I just said, what, do you want me to be accountable to you? And he said, no, 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 I wasn't saying that. I was just asking. And uh, I said, well, if you'd like to talk about it, we can talk about it. So we agreed to meet for breakfast the next day. And we're going to talk about accountability. And I'm, I'm starting to get ready. I'm, what am I going to do about this? He's, he's going to ask me who am I accountable to. Who? So I started thinking, what am I going to do? I, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to decide right now what weaknesses I want to share so that I make sure that I control the agenda. And so we met together the next morning, and I'd heard Benjamin Franklin, uh, apparently, I just listened to his, his, his uh, biography uh, on audio last year, but I remember reading that uh, Benjamin Franklin one day decided to list his 12 greatest weaknesses and each week to work on one of them in sequence and so that he could work on one weakness and then the next through the first 12 and then rotate in four times a year he'd work on all those. So I wrote out all of my weaknesses that I could think of, had 12 of them and I went to the next day to meet with my friend Bob and I said, I've been thinking about Benjamin Franklin, I'm thinking about being accountable to you, here are my weaknesses, I want you to help me with them. And he said, how come just 12? And I said, well, isn't that pretty good? And he said, David, there's 52 weeks, you need 13. <laughs> so I had to come up with something else, math's one of my weaknesses I guess. The reason I tell you that is because we got together every Wednesday to talk, to support each other. Pretty mechanical if you think about it, right? We're going to meet every week to talk about how can we help each other. But let me tell you about what we did. On, see, on that list, there were some things, some of these things might be on your list. On that list, um, I'm critical of others. I don't date my wife regularly like I know I should. I don't spend quality time with our kids. I don't honor my mom and dad like I know I should. And the list went on and on. So Bob said, why don't we meet every Wednesday and you can work on one of these and you can tell me how you're doing every week. So Bob and I started meeting every Wednesday. And he said, you know, I think you should change those cards. I think, he said, I think you should change those, those, those weaknesses. And why don't you write them out in terms of the positive, what you want God to do in your life. So you write, write it out. I spend quality time with each of my kids. I love my wife. I honor my mom and dad, etc. I'm not critical. I'm affirming of others. Why don't you write out what you want to be? And then pray each week that God would help you. To, so I, I wrote them all out, made little plasticized cards I kept in my dressing room in the morning. So every morning I'd have a card I'd be looking at and remember, I've got to talk to Bob next week. I better do something about this. The reason I want to tell you about that is, obviously, it's, this didn't happen by accident. We're purposeful about building a relationship. But I want to tell you about the difference. I retired one of those cards a few years ago. The card that says, I honor my father and mother by spending time with them. I retired that card with a smile. You know why? Because my friend Bob kept me accountable to loving my parents. Who have you got in your life that going to encourage you to do those things? You, you know what you should be doing. Who do you have in your life going to help you? And so I would submit to you that friends are not found like a lost penny. Friendship can be built by being purposeful. And so I had the chance to journey in relationship with these guys. So in the remaining time we've got, what I'd like to do is share with you, so what? I've done a little bit. What difference does it make? So I'd like to give you four examples. If I could do that, then we'll have a chance to chat. Is that okay? So first example I want to give you is what difference has it made in my marriage? Task-oriented functionary. Guess how good I am at relationships. So my wife and I got married and... Oh, well, let's back up a little bit. Before we got married. I'm a planner by nature. 
So our family company had built 31 churches. So I wanted us to get married in a church we had built. Is that okay? I had my favorite one where my sister got married, and that's where I wanted us to get married. I was, right? Okay. My uncle was a pastor, so I wanted him to marry us. I thought that the vows, the traditional vows, were a bit hokey, so I wanted, us to, I wanted to write the vows. You're starting to get the picture? My siblings had all gone to San Francisco for their honeymoon. That's family tradition. That's where we should go for our honeymoon. Right? I, I, I did all of the planning. I was just looking for a bride to fit into my picture. No, nobody had ever told me that this was the bride's day. I'd, I'd always seen two people at the front. Like, I thought it was a partnership deal, right? If she's gonna, not going to, if she has no ideas, let's go. I even chose the color of the bridesmaid's dresses. <laughs> hey, hey, look, look. No, 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 I'm a planner. Come on. The way, the way I looked at it was really simple. Um, Green, green is the color of growth. I wanted us to grow in our love together. So I was going to be married in a dark green custom-made suit. You can't buy one of those off the shelf. So it was, it was, at least I didn't look like a leprechaun. It was actually quite nice. Um, <laughs> I was going to get married in a green suit, so my wife needed everybody. So we had green bridesmaids' dresses, and I was married in a th green three-piece suit. Fast forward, uh, we're in, we moved to Calgary for a couple of years, we moved to Toronto for a while, and one of my friends says, I don't think your wife's very happy. And I said, how come? He said, well, she, I've, I've talked to her, she seems pretty unhappy. And I said, why is she unhappy? He said, well, why do you think she should be happy? And I said, well, I don't, I don't know. I said, I think we've got a good life. We've got a couple of kids, married, pregnant with our third. She said, well, he said, well, what is your life like? And I said, well, living in Toronto. I said, I go to... Uh, uh, I go to Winnipeg on business every other week for a couple days. On the weekends, we go water skiing together. Like, I don't know why she's not happy. We live in a condo downtown. She has no friends. She has no money. She looks over from our, I give her no money to spend. She looks over at all these fancy stores. She can't go there. I don't spend much time looking after the kids. I don't know why she's unhappy. And my friend said to me, and very interesting, Barry, one of these friends that I started journeying with, Barry said to me, he said, did you know that every wife, every woman, has a built-in marriage manual? You can write this down, by the way. Every woman has, a, God's given every woman a built-in marriage manual. Three questions and you can get everything you need to know in order to build your marriage. First question, on a scale of one to ten, how would you rate our marriage? I've mentioned this a few times before and people say, well, what if her scale is wrong? <laughs> the issue is it's her scale, so she gets to decide, right? So first question, ask your wife, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate our marriage? And she'll know. Second question, would you like us to move closer to 10? Now, if she says no, then you probably do need to go to see a counselor. But um, second question is, on a, would you like us to move closer to 10? Third question, what can I, as your husband, do to help us move closer to 10? That's, that's it. That's all you need to know. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate our marriage? Would you like us to move closer to 10? What can I, as your husband, do to help us move closer to 10? So I thought, I'm going to try this. We're in the car driving. We'd just, we'd just gone away for the weekend. We'd driven up late at night because I'd worked till uh, 8 o'clock that night. We'd driven up to this cottage, we got, up there, got there about midnight. I woke my wife up at 6 to drive me while the water was calm. She looked after the kids while I napped. She drove me that night. Then she's driving home with the trailer. I'm having a wonderful time. So... Um, I said to her, so Allison, I have a question for you. Um, on a scale of one to 10, would you like, or, uh, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate our marriage? She looked at me and she said, are you sure you want to know? For the first time in our marriage, I lied. I said, yes, I did not want to know. She said, five. Well, that got me to thinking, five, what the heck does five mean? Five, 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 what does that mean? Five, that's five out of 10, that's like 50%, 50%. What's that like as a letter grade, 50%? That's one better than failure. Maybe we have a problem. 
So notice, I didn't ask her the other two questions. I was completely distracted by that. I didn't ask. The purpose is to ask the other two questions. I didn't ask the other questions. I just started working on it. I went back, I talked to my friend Barry, and I, said, I told him I'd ask the questions. He said, what did she say? And I told him about the score. And what did she say after that? And I forgot to ask her. And he said, well, let me give you some coaching. David, could you just take her into consideration a little more often? Like you moved to Calgary without asking her. You moved to Toronto without asking her. Next time you move, at least ask her first, would you? So we were talking a few weeks later, and I, he said, how's it going? I said, it's good. I, I'm putting into practice what you told me. And I, he said, what's that? And I said, well, we're thinking about moving to California. And I asked Allison first. And he said, so what did she think? And he said, well, she doesn't want to go, but we're going anyway. And he said, well, <laughs> He said, he said, you know, you ask, you ask, ask listen to what she says. Well, I, I didn't even tell me that part. <laughs> so with this kind of effort, uh, we moved to California, and I'm working my darndest, entirely in my flesh, trying to love this woman and trying to figure out how to make this thing work, not asking her anything, just busy trying to get it done. So a few months go by, and I say, so, sweetheart, I'm thinking things are great now. I've dragged her to California. She doesn't want to go there, but it's, it's going to be way better now. So, so on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate our marriage? Three. You might have noticed a trend. This is not a good trend. And I've talked to Allison since then, and I've said to her, you know, when you said our marriage was a three on a scale of one to 10, were you really being fair? You know what she said? She said, she said I was giving you the benefit of the doubt, son. <laughs> our, our marriage was in, it was in deep trouble, and so, uh, we, we got ourselves into a whale of difficulty and we moved back to Vancouver and um, things continued to, to fall apart and I'm happy to, to share more but in the interest of time um, I told you about these two friends Carson and Bob who I spent time with and we started journeying together in friendship and decided to invite them over for dinner one night and um, my wife Allison on a Saturday morning said to me they were going to come over Saturday night she said your friends Carson and Bob are coming tonight could you please go to the store and pick up some things for dinner? Now, I don't know how you feel about shopping. I hate shopping. I don't know how you feel about grocery shopping. I really like, dislike grocery shopping. And I don't know how you feel about grocery shopping on Saturday morning, but I loathe grocery shopping on Saturday morning. So when my wife said, would you please go to the store and pick up some things, I used that little word I learned in grade two. No. And she said, these are your friends that are coming over for dinner. I said, this is your kitchen. And she said, I've had a really busy week. And I said, playing tennis five times? And she said, you know, I, I've had a lot of things on. Can't you help me? This is a crisis. And I remember my secretary had a little sign on her desk that said, a lack of planning on your part doesn't constitute a crisis on my part. I don't know if I said that. <laughs> so the next thing I know, Allison picks up the phone. She phones Carson and says, hey, Carson, um, I know you guys are going to come over for dinner tonight, but David and I aren't talking. There's no food in the fridge. We better cancel. <laughs> and he said, sounds like it's exactly the time we should come over. So he and his wife, Brenda, drove over, and I remember thinking, Sheriff's coming. <laughs> and Carson and Brenda came over, and it was, as they came to the back door, they, they were hugging, and Allison, and I'm going, oh, man, they're on her side already. <laughs> and then I explained how, you know, a lack of planning on my, and they said, <laughs> anyway, they, they came over and helped us to be able to talk that through, and we ordered pizza. I didn't have to go to the store, but they were able to help us. And I want to ask you the question, who do you have in your life? who will come over when you're being a jerk and will say, this is exactly the time. I think I need to be there to help you. I've got a couple guys in my life who are going to come over when I need someone to sit me down and help walk me through, help me rebuild my relationship. I've got a couple guys. who have made a difference in my marriage. Another example I want to give you talking about was about Carson, talk about Bob. Uh, when I was in my, in my business, I was trying to think through what to do and I mentioned this earlier today, this idea that I wanted to create this vision to the business to be the John Ward of Canada. And it was, it was Bob who came over and said to me, David, you know, that sounds pretty arrogant. Why don't we think about this differently? And he was the one who helped me to think about how could I 
be like Jesus was with Bartimaeus and take on this attitude of Jesus, which is, what do you want me to do for you? So Bob was the one who sat me down and helped me to realize what I really want to do in my professional life is to be a, a man of service. And so Carson helped me to patch up my relationship with my wife and has continued to do that. Bob is someone who's walked with me in my relationship, in my work career and has helped me to think about that. And so these men have helped me as I, whether it be career or, or my personal life. But Greg Leith said earlier today that we made a covenant of eight things we signed up to do. One of the things we signed up to do is to pray for each other. I'll give you an example about that. One day I was um, in my office and I got a call from the Darth Vader figure in my life. And I was panicking. Darth Vader's on the phone. He wants to see me right away. So I hung up the phone and I, Carson and Bob have covenanted to me that they will support me and pray with me at any time. So I phoned Carson and I'm walking on the plaza between a couple buildings downtown. He said, where are you? And I said, I'm on the plaza between Bentall 3 and Bentall 4. And he, and he said, sit down. I said, well, on the plaza? No, he said, find a bench, sit down. So I sat down on the bench. He said, can I just, he said, what's going on? I said, well, Darth Vader wants to see me right away. He said, well, let me just pray with you first. And so he prayed with me before I got in the elevator to go up and see Darth Vader. My heart was still pounding but I had this prayer support of my buddy and I knew, I was reminded that the Lord was with me. I knew Carson was with me and I knew that he was praying for me. I knew as I went to see Darth Vader, I wasn't alone, that I had God's presence. I was reminded that I had my buddy praying. So I went and see Darth Vader, wanted to know if I could remember something from five years ago. I couldn't remember, it was no big deal. Who do you have in your life who you can phone on a moment's notice when Darth Vader calls? I got a couple guys in my life who I can phone at any time when Darth Vader calls. And so as we move to wrap up, I'm going to give some time for questions at the end here, but I, I wanted to just share a couple other things quickly. Uh, uh, one last thing that these two men did when, remember I mentioned that uh, um, auction that we had in our family business so that my sisters and I could decide if we weren't going to be partners, we could b put the company up for auction. So after being in partnership for 10 years, we came to that place. And my brother-in-law ended up putting on piece of paper in writing, an offer to buy the company from me. Well, Carson and Bob at that time had invited me to go away for a prayer retreat for 24 hours. And I remember panicking again. I said, you guys, I can pray for five minutes. What are we going to do for 24 hours? Like a, they said, we'll look after you. It's okay. We'll so we went up to the Abbey at Mission and uh, Jesuit uh, Monastery, and we, and we spent some time there praying and talking. And the guys said, so what can we pray for you about? And I said, well, I'm struggling with this. My brother-in-law is offering me the opportunity to buy the business or counter back and buy him. Like, I'm trying to figure out what to do. And they said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, on the one hand, this is the company my grandfather worked for my, for 40 years. My dad was there for 50 years. I've been there for 20 years. This is my heritage. This is my legacy. This is my life. This is my identity. I think I should buy the business. And they said, well, that sounds pretty clear. What's the other hand? I said, well, on the other hand, I don't like construction. I never wanted to be in construction. I decided in high school I don't want to be in construction. And now I'm stuck. I've been there for 10 years. I don't like it. I don't like going to work. I, don't, I have no passion for the business. I don't think I belong there. And I've got a full price offer with no minority discount for something I don't even want to do. And they said, well, that's pretty clear. <laughs> what the heck do you do with that? So my two friends. You know what they said? Carson said, David, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Good friends are like that. They don't tell you what to do. But Carson said, if you decide to go to the bank, borrow some money, and buy the business, we will be with you. On the other hand, if in your 40s, if you decide to sell the business and start your life all over again, we'll be with you. And I said, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> but you know, that did make a huge difference because no matter which path I chose, I had two men who were going to be with me, so it gave me the courage to choose, because I knew I wasn't alone. And then, so that's what, Bob, that's what Carson did for me. What did Bob do for me? Bob said to me, David, if you were, a, uh, if you were walking down uh, Burrard Street in downtown Vancouver, and someone offered to sell you a construction company, would you buy it? And I said, no. He said, how come? And I said, because I don't like construction. I already told you that. He said, well, why are you looking at buying this company? And I said, well, this isn't just a construction company. This is the construction company. And he said, David, let me give you some information. He said, I'm a lawyer. A construction company is simply a piece of paper. That's all it is. So it got me thinking. 
if I bought a construction company, would I hire me to run it? I thought, how do you know whether someone's any good to run anything? And um, you might find it interesting how I answered that question. You see, when I was 24, I was a student of management. I never met Peter Drucker, but I wish I had. But as a kid, I used to follow America's team, Dallas Cowboys. I used to watch Tom Landry's. Tom Landry's, he walked back and forth up on the sideline. How did that guy with the hat create the winningest team in professional football? So I wrote Tom Landry a letter. I said, I'm a student of management. I'd like to know how you do that. And he said, training camp starts next week. Be in my office at 3.20, I'll give you 20 minutes. We were living in Southern California, so I drove over, met with Tom Landry. I, I was early, it was the only time I'd ever been early for anything. Met with Tom Landry, and we chatted. And he, we had a good conversation. I'm happy to tell you more about it later if you're interested. But what I took away from that conversation, do you know why Tom Landry was good? He loved football. He was passionate about it. And I thought, you know, if I, if I bought this construction company, I'd want somebody who, to run it who is passionate about it. I wouldn't like this. So I realized I disqualified myself. I shouldn't, I shouldn't buy this company. I wouldn't hire me to run it. So I, I made the decision. As I told my friends that I wouldn't hire me to run it, they said, well, I think your decision is pretty clear, ain't it? So I sold the business to my sister and her husband. It was a pretty tough decision. Toughest decision I've ever had to make in my life. Who do you have in your life you can call when you've got tough decisions to make? I've been blessed with a couple of men who I can talk to when I've got tough decisions to make. Before we wrap up, I've got two last things I want to share. The, the first one is from an email that my son sent me. Because our son John, we only have, we have three girls and a boy. Super proud of our son John. He was a hellion in his teen years. He was all, it was, you could get drunk on the fumes in his, in his room. He was a pretty wild kid. But now, God, by God's grace, he's over at the University of Durham doing, doing his PhD in Old Testament studies. Felt God's call on his life to, to make a difference. So it's pretty exciting. But John wrote me this letter when he was uh, 21. And I had just started the new business, doing the work I've shared with you a little bit, working as an advisor to families in business. And um, our son John wrote this. And I, I was going to change the website. I had a website that had been pulled together. I didn't like it, so I was putting a new website together. And John said, I didn't even know you had a website. I want to go see the original one. I said, no, 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 I'm getting rid of it. I'm embarrassed. I don't want you to see it. He said, oh, I want to see the original before you tear it down. I said, no, no, I don't. I said he could go look. So here's what our son John wrote to me. Hey, Dad, I just checked out your website. It looks great. It's not cheesy at all. Also looks kind of professional and cutting edge, kind of like you know what you're doing. <laughs> this might sound weird, but I'm proud of you with your new business. I look up to you a lot. All of my friends love you, look up to you as well. By the way, that's a reminder, we need to love our kids' friends. Even if, right now, today, right now, today, if I go to the prayer hut, you know what I'm going to ask? I'm going to ask to pray a pr prayer for our daughter Jenny because she's dating a guy who I don't think is the right thing. Right? We have to, I, we, Alice and I, we need to love him. Right? We need to pray, for, we need to love our kids' friends. I look up to you a lot. All my friends love you and look up to you as well. It's cool that you're doing such a unique and necessary job, meaning family business stuff. And it seems like you're more in your element than you were at Dominion, the construction company. Notice the sensitivity of a 21-year-old kid. Not that you didn't do a good job there. <laughs> and then he called it out. But maybe this is your calling. And the 20 years there were just leading up to it. My friends, Carson and Bob, took me to the Abbey, prayed with me, and helped me to discover my life calling. Hadn't been for them, I think I would still be trying to ride that construction pony that I didn't belong on. Then our son John goes on, he says, hey, I'm excited to read your book. This is the company you keep. I don't know when I'll get to it because of all my school reading. At that point, his halo, his halo collapsed. Like, what, what do you mean? It, it, his school reading's more important than dad's book? Anyway, whatever. 
hopefully soon. Congrats on getting it published, and just on writing it, that's quite an accomplishment. Anyway, just want to tell you that I'm pumped for all the stuff you're doing these days, and thanks for all you do and all you've done for me. But then he says three things that just belong between a father and a son. But uh, suffice to say, when I showed them to my wife yesterday again, she said uh, she started to cry. You see, our son John could see that uh, with the help of my friends, I discovered God's calling. Who do you have in your life who can help speak into your life, help you to find your life's calling? The last thing I want to say is that because I ended up being the guy who wrote this book about friendship, I'm the one who gets to speak about it. Carson and Bob, uh, my two life partners, my two covenant partners, um, don't often speak about this, but Bob said to me, David, whenever you speak about our friendship, would you share something with others for me? And I said, sure, I'd be delighted. So I'd like to share with you three things that Bob said. He said, um, in life, we all have wonderful times, great times, mountaintop experiences when things are going great. And he said, it's a shame to go through life and not have friends who can share those triumphs with us. He said, when we have great things happen, we should have friends to be able to celebrate with. Kind of like Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. And he said, on the other hand, when we go through difficult times, when dif when type, when ti when ti when difficult times come, whether it be in our marriage or our career, when we're having tough times, like when Jesus went to the garden, when we're having difficult times, we shouldn't have to go through those times crying alone. We should be, have friends to be with us. And then we come to the end of our lives. We shouldn't be alone. We should have friends around us, like my dad had around him. And so from the words of my friend Bob, I'd like to invite you to consider investing in the kind of friendships that Jesus had with Peter, James, and John, because at the end of the day, we should never have to fly alone. We should never have to cry alone. At the end of our lives, we should never have to die alone. Thank you.